Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming for the presentation today. Um, before I start, I want to thank Professor Farzana Nalini and Soumya for organizing the conference. Um, I am Karmini. I'll be presenting to you today results from an RCT titled Tackling Sexual Harassment Evidence from India. Um, to, I also would like to apologize in advance in case I use terminologies that make you uncomfortable. I'll keep the usage to a minimum. So we know that one in three women would have would suffer from sexual from sexual violence globally in any given year, and this is quite a stable statistic. Sexual harassment is a kind of sexual violence that can occur when potential perpetrators and victims may not know each other, uh, say in the case of uh, street harassment, or when they do, for in, in the case of interpersonal environments like universities or workplaces, which is also the focus of this paper. But sexual harassment in these latter type of environments is quite a complicated phenomenon. Why? Because they can facilitate relationships with benefits like access to job opportunities, romantic relationships, future job referrals, and so on. But such relationships can also have costs like repeated exposure to sexual harassment and abuse if, if a person in, in the relationship is, say, an abuser. At the same time, uh, these environments are also characterized by common fears. So think about classmates in the case of universities or colleagues in the case of workplaces who can sanction or intervene, creating social costs to harassment, thereby deterring harassment. But they can also protect harassers, creating social incentives to harass. However, on top of it, sexual harassment, especially in this case, is, a, is also a taboo topic. So lack of conversation about sexual harassment can create lack of awareness about it, not just about sexual harassment, but also about others' attitudes towards it. So I undertake an RCT of sexual harassment and awareness trainings within colleges to study these phenomena. I collaborate with three colleges in New Delhi, India to study first whether sexual harassment awareness training for men helps to reduce sexual harassment for women, and secondly, whether it affects relationships between men and women. The three mechanisms that I'll show you uh, evidence on is first whether these trainings alleviate any kind of awareness constraints if they exist, whether they change intrinsic attitudes or beliefs about sexual harassment insofar as I can measure them, and whether these trainings affect perception of social costs versus legal costs to harassment. By perception of social costs, I mean costs that can be imposed by one's peers that I was talking about in the previous slide. And by legal costs, I mean the ones that can be imposed by the a legal complaints committee in a college or in a workplace. In a last step, I will compare the results with a sexual harassment awareness intervention that I undertook with women in a separate college. So what do I find? I find that there, the sexual harassment awareness training with men leads to a significant and robust I, um, however, I cannot reject a null effect on milder forms of sexual harassment. As far as, op uh, as far as relationships between men and women go, I find that there is increased gender segregation. So there is a reduction in relationships between men and women in treatment units by around 0.2 standard deviations. And this is driven by, a, uh, by women's choices and that I measure through a lab in the field experiment. Regarding mechanisms, I find that the, the training does increase men's awareness by around 0.1 standard deviations, but a null effect on intrinsic beliefs or preferences of some one standard deviations for these men, but there is no effect on their perception of legal costs to harassment. In contrast to all of this, the female awareness intervention has no effect on men's perceived social or legal costs on their awareness or on sexual harassment reported by women. But it also leads to a reduction in women's relationships with all men. But there is an important difference in this result between male and female intervention that I'll talk about. Karmini, uh, Sheetal has a question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, are you going to momentarily tell us how you define it or you know, how, how do we think about it? Is it legal sexual harassment or how, how should we think about it? Are you just going to tell us about that shortly or?
um no. so uh sorry, i could not i could not hear the entire question uh do you think we can take it at the end or should should i answer it in the in the, in between the presentation um so i think carmine it's a, a clarificatory question that how do you define sexual harassment okay okay yes yeah, so i will uh i will uh, come to uh, come to that when i come to the measurement uh, question yes um so um regarding uh, regarding the contributions to the literature um i this paper contributes to uh, three important strands firstly is the strand that looks at the effect of awareness trainings uh, on uh, on attitudes towards gender violence against women or anti social behavior so there is this work by dhar et al that we all most of us will know about is a uh, uh, gender sensitization training in haryana with students green et al banerjee et al and full of it et al in africa um that look at the effect on uh, attitudes towards intimate partner violence and then blackman et al and heller et al uh, that basically uh, in similar uh, um uh, uh design to this paper provide uh, intervention to potential perpetrators of crimes and look at their anti social behaviors i contribute to this literature by studying effects on sexual harassment where there might be a lack of knowledge about the nature of the crime itself and also the role of uh, perceived legal and social costs uh, in deterring uh, perpetration uh the second strand of literature is the one that tries that studies uh, impact of sexual harassment in one shot uh, interactions like street harassment or repeated interactions like domestic violence or workplaces so there is work by folke and written in sweden the recent work uh, calvi and kasper on domestic violence aguilar et al uh, on street harassment similarly condolis et al in brazil um and then hoshhofer et al that similar to this uh, similar in spirit to the uh, to the paper look at the effects of intervention on both men and women on um, on actual incidents of intimate partner violence i study sexual harassment within in, uh, semi formal organizations where interactions are repeated and also study effects on interpersonal relationships between men and women the third strand of literature is uh, uh, the one that looks at perce how perception or actual social incentives um sorry how perception of social incentives or actual social incentives change behavior um and um i uh, contribute to this literature by looking at the role of such incentives in the in the context of sexual harassment so i'll go through the context the design the specification results theoretical framework to bring all of it together and uh, compare with the female intervention so here i'm showing you in this table the results from a survey that i did with one of the uh, colleges uh, and here i asked women about sexual harassment in the two months prior uh, to the uh, to the um, to the survey now here uh, okay i think we've lost her again <laughs> it's amazing that in england the network connection is worse than it is in india <laughs> uh maybe we should have asked her for her a video recording you know like i was part of this uh, conference uh, where we had presenters from africa and all over the world uh, it was this big iussp uh, conference and so we had to get video recordings for everyone because we weren't sure about the quality of the internet connection but i didn't expect this here at all <laughs> so farzana can i move all the so are we okay to move all the presentations by 5 7 minutes now that you know so how how would we proceed nishit do you want to i don't know uh what should we do i think uh, we should wait and like if there is a room for few minutes or she can yeah just... yeah at least we should wait for a few minutes for her to come back unfortunately uh maybe yeah there's nothing that we can do we'll at least hang on because there's nothing after these three papers uh yeah. that that's time bound exactly so we can move all the presentations okay i thought she is uh, uh, not in england
she's back. Yeah. Uh, Karmini, I suggest that you keep your video your, off. Yeah. Because I think that's causing a problem. Yes. And uh, if you could, uh, no, obviously it's too late now, but we don't have your slides. So on the site, if you can just email it to us. Okay. Do you, but you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. So, so I find that uh, nearly 17% women have suffered from, uh, 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 you know, say that they have suffered from extreme type of events like pinching, groping, and fondling. Uh, that, that is also a, a, a very high prevalence over a period of two months. So regarding the design, so the intervention was, uh, was such that all men uh, in a treatment unit, which I'll be clearer about, were provided with sexual harassment awareness training together. Now, the training had two main components. First was awareness about principles of detecting harassment, hypothetical case scenarios, laws against harassment, and examples of harassment. Uh, and this is what a standard sexual harassment awareness training will also include. A second component is, however, an empathy building component, which was much shorter. However, uh, in the previous reading of uh, social psychology literature, I found that some, some of these trainings can have a backlash effect. So to minimize the, uh, the uh, probability of such backlash and also to help men understand why we wanted to talk to them about sexual harassment, we had this uh, uh, component where we discussed original but anonymized narratives uh, from sexual harassment victims in their own college. Now, this training was provided over two workshops or two sessions uh, for a total of about three to five hours over one academic semester by collaborating NGO trainers. Uh, they, they used uh, skits, discussions, and, and narratives to basically to, uh, to deliver the content. One male and one female trainer was in all sessions. Now, the design uh, is very uh, uh, basic. So uh, as an overview, firstly, we did a baseline survey with men and women. Uh, then we did the training with the men in the treatment classes. Uh, I'll be clear of what it is. And then we did the online training approximately three months after the training. Now, the, think about these colleges as mini universities for those of us who do not know about the context. Uh, and then, so think about economics here. One is one class, sociology or two is another class, philosophy or three is another class and so on. Now, first, I stratified these classes by field of study, year of study, and sex ratio at the baseline. And, and then they were basically randomized to receive the training or not. Um, so regarding data collection, so this uh, is an important part of the, uh, you know, of the topic. So regarding sexual harassment data, um, I found, in, so there are two main concerns that come. First is uh, under-reporting and the second is under-detection. And my piloting showed that the most important problem turned out to be under-detection. And to deal with that, what I do is that I provide all women in treatment and control classes with information on what sexual harassment is. This information, again, comes from the awareness training that was developed by, um, uh, you know, sorry, that uh, it comes from the, um, uh, from the NGO trainers who also developed the male intervention to avoid any differences in detection of harassment by women. Um, I also allude to the paper by Cullen et al. Uh, sorry, by Cullen that shows that there is no significant difference in reporting of non-intimate partner violence between an ACASI type of method and LIST method. ACASI type of method is the one that I've used in this paper and LIST methods are the ones that help to deal with, uh, with uh, sensitive uh, stigma associated with uh, sensitive questions. Um, and thirdly, I think still importantly, all women answered the survey themselves in a separate room with an all female staff to assure uh, them assistance and comfort. And these, uh, um, uh, these measures are, are at least as much, if not more comprehensive than have been seen in the literature on sexual harassment. Now, to look at attitudes, awareness, and preferences is also very complicated because of the topic. So what did I do? To look at awareness, I asked both men and women about objective questions on sexual harassment using hypothetical case scenarios, uh, to, which helps to reduce social desirability because these questions ask them about legal, you know, whether something was legally sexual harassment or not, and rather than what they think is harassment or not. 
Secondly, to look at attitudes, uh, to get at intrinsic attitudes towards harassment, I used a list experiment and a Google form exercise. So in the list experiment, I gave a random group of students um, uh, three statements that were contentious but not stigmatized, but related to sexual harassment. And the other group received the same statements, but a, a statement on victim blaming attitudes, which is, uh, which is stigmatized. And then I compare the two and I'll show you the results. Um, then I used the data from a Google form uh, that was uh, uh, circulated by the college in all classes where uh, it asked students to volunteer for anti-sexual harassment organizations and I used whether and I checked whether there was any differential signups in treatment versus control classes. Thirdly, to look at preferences, I designed the lab in the field experiment to test for changes in men and women's uh, preferences to cooperate uh, in mixed and same gender pairs and I'll tell you about it in detail. So regarding the specification, uh, it's straightforward, but the main specification suppose on sexual harassment uh, is, is such that, so I'm regressing the sexual harassment outcome for, student, for female I in class C in college G on treatment status of her uh, male peers. So whether her class was assigned to the male intervention or not on socioeconomic controls that are selected by a post double selection lasso method, college fixed effects, straight up fixed effects and standard errors that are clustered at the class level to deal with arbitrary correlation at, the, at that level. There is no differential attrition by treatment or by covariance on the treatment. And we are able to um, uh, cover uh, more than 80%, sorry, more than 80% of women and uh, nearly 80% of men. So here I'm showing you the balance test. So um, firstly, uh, the balance test goes through for all baseline uh, variables. Um, and I find that, uh, so the, the students, you mostly have highly educated parents. Most of them belong to SCs, STs, and OBCs. Uh, and they have, and 23% of them report that they have a working mother, which is also close to the female uh, labor force participation rate, according to the re recent numbers. The F stat reject that these variables together explain assignment to the treatment. So here I come to the main result, uh, results. So here I have standardized all the outcomes. I am showing you here results, uh, sorry, uh, dependent variable where I, again, asked women about different types of sexual harassment that they faced from men in their own class. So here I am able to say whether harassment came from men who were treated or not. Now to interpret this, um, here, um, women are telling me from male uh, from male treatment classes that there are 0.06 standard deviations less likely to have suffered from a mild even like sexual joke or remark uh, from a man in their class but i cannot reject it from a null effect uh, to be different from a null effect and the same for intermediate events like stalking staring and online sexual harassment in contrast to that, I find that extreme forms of harassment reduce by 0.125 standard deviations, which is more than double the, uh, the effect on mild events. Um, I find that this result is robust to selection on attrition uh, through a Lee bound exercise and also to multiple hypotheses testing. Now, to I also, as a placebo, I also asked women about sexual harassment from men in other classes or from outside the college to basically see whether this could be driven by women not wanting to report such events. And what I find is that there is no such reduction that I can see for extreme events uh, from, from men from different class or from men outside college. So it gives me the confidence that this is uh, uh, as a result of the, um, uh, the uh, changes in men's behavior. Now to look at effects on relationships between men and women, uh, I collected two types of outcomes. These were survey measures where I asked women about uh, romantic relationships, so whether they were dating someone in their own class or not, and their friendships. Now for friendships, uh, I look at the proportion of uh, opposite gender friends that they report in their class. I find that the training reduces romantic relationships by nearly 43%, but there is negative and insignificant, sorry, a negative but insignificant effect on uh, friendships. Now, because these are equilibrium outcomes in the sense that uh, both men and women have to agree 
need to be in a relationship in an ideal kind of uh, scenario. So either one of them can uh, may want to not be in a relationship and that can lead to a dissolution. So to see whether whether these this dissolution of romantic relationships was from men or from women, I designed this lab in the field experiment. What did I do? I randomly paired students with each other with their classmates. So by design, some of them were in a same gender pair and others in a mixed gender pair within the same class. Now, then I asked them to read about an experimental task uh, that was uh, that also created complementarity for opposite gender pairs. And I asked them to tell me whether they wanted to do this uh, task together with their partner or they wanted to switch away from their partner. The margin I use is where the students, uh, whether men or women, are more likely to want to stick with their opposite gender partner versus switching away from the same gender partner in treatment versus the control classes. So I'm able to use variation from uh, their, the pairs and also the treatment. What do I find? So here again, I have standardized all the variables to facilitate comparison. In the upper panel, I have results for men. And in the lower panel, I'm showing you the results for women. Now in column two, I'm showing you results for dating and both men and women are 0 0.02 standard deviations less likely to be dating anyone in their own class. There is no effect on uh, opposite gender, uh, opposite sex uh, friends. However, the coefficients are negative. Now, to look at where these results might be coming from, what do I find? So contrary to the popular narrative, I find that in fact, men were more comfortable in wanting to do the task with the women. So we would think that men would become more cautious after this training, but that's not what the lab experiment shows. On the other hand, what I find is that women are less likely to want to switch away from their same gender partner in treatment versus the control so this gives me uh, evidence that if anything, the results on opposite gender relationships are being driven by women most likely. So to bring all of this together quickly now in a theoretical framework, what I do is I adapt the framework in Burstein et al's model uh, uh, in uh, on misperception in uh, misperception regarding women's uh, uh, regarding norms of women's uh, labor force participation in Saudi Arabia. So I model an interaction between men and women. And the model is such that I assume there are two types of men, bad or good type for lack of better words. Um, and, I, uh, and they can take two observable actions, high or low. High actions are sexual harassment and low actions are non-sexually aggressive actions. Now the bad types prefer to do a high action and the good types prefer to do a low action. I assume also that there is a proportion Q of observers, in this case classmates, who are perceived to approve a high action and the rest of them approve a low action. Now, also men suffer from psychic costs if they do not do actions that are optimum for their type. And I assume these costs are uh, uniform distri uh, uniformly distributed over zero and one. A man is characterized by his type and his cost. Now, men and women are randomly paired with each other and men are senders of their signal, which is the action and women are going to uh, infer what is the type of the man based on that signal or that action. Women form beliefs about the type of men. Men's utility has three main components. The first is the utility from being matched with a woman. Second is the cost of not doing something that they want to do that is preferred by their type. And the third is the social incentive or the, so sorry, the utility that they get from the, uh, from the classmates, right? The social incentives to do the different actions. Women want to match with a good type and they do that with the probability of, with, a, with basically the inference that they make about the, about the men's type. And they receive a zero uh, a utility W naught if they are matched with good types and zero otherwise. A separating equilibrium is straightforward. Good type men do uh, uh, good, uh, so low actions, that is non-sexually aggressive actions. Bad type men do the uh, aggressive actions, they separate, so women know about this in equilibrium and they get matched with the good type men. But a partial to a complete pooling equilibrium is such that some of the bad type men can choose to mimic or pool with the good type men by doing the same action that is preferred by these good types because of the social costs of doing a high action. If the proportion, if the social cost of doing a high action that is sexually harassing in a class increases, then that also increases the incentive for this pooling. Now, women can infer this in equilibrium. 
right? And because they can infer, they will reduce the likelihood that they accept a low action from a man. So even if a man approaches a woman, say, with a good behavior, she can, she is less likely to now want to match with him. And that's because of this pooling. So the training can have two effects. Firstly, it can increase good type men in the classes, decreasing harassment because less men now harass, but also increase relationships because women know about it. Secondly is, however, if there is, a, is, if there is an increase in perceived social disapproval of harassment, that can decrease harassment again because of pooling, but it also decreases relationships because women reduce likelihood of accepting a low action. Female treatment can only reduce relationships without changing sexual harassment, at least in this framework, because men have not been given the training. So, uh, regarding so, uh, so now to look at the uh, to look at these mechanisms empirically, I find firstly that overall the first proof of concept goes through the training increases uh, the awareness of men, and this is an these are all standardized outcomes again. Um, sorry, columns one, four, and five are standardized, and two and three are not are not. Um, on the other hand, for columns two and three, which measure intrinsic attitudes that I told you about in one of the previous slides, I find there is no change uh, in, uh, or I cannot reject a null effect on uh, victim blaming attitudes or uh, the proportion who sign up to volunteer. The coefficients are close to zero and very small related to the uh, control mean as well. On the other hand, I find that there is a significant increase in perceived social cost to sexual harassment as um, reported by women. It's significant at the 1%, but there is no change in perception of legal cost to sexual harassment. So this is uh, uh, consistent with the theoretical framework where I show that a change or increase in perceived social cost can create these pooling incentives that can drive women away from men who have been treated. And that's because uh, some of the good type men are now behaving uh, you know, nicely or maybe strangely. Now here I'm going to compare my results with a female awareness intervention. What did I do here? Again, classes were stratified on field of study, year of study, baseline sex ratios. Half of the classes received high intensity. So 75% women received the treatment and 25% in the other classes. Uh, again, women received the awareness component of the treatment, uh, unlike the male intervention where there was also an empathy building because we do not need it here. Um, at least, uh, you know, uh, I'm assuming that we would not need it here. Uh, the data collection methodology was exactly the same for all outcomes uh, as the male intervention. Now here I'm showing you the coefficient plots for the mechanism outcomes. Uh, these are similar to the outcomes I showed you in the last table. What do we find? Firstly, in, uh, in red, I'm showing you the results, uh, the coefficients for the female treatment, and in blue, uh, coefficients for male treatment, just to facilitate comparison. All these outcomes are for men. Now I find that the female intervention has no effect on men's awareness or on perception of social costs, or on legal costs, or on victim blaming attitudes. But um, yeah, and, in and that's in contrast to the male intervention, which did increase their awareness and did increase the perceived social costs. So with awareness, I think it's intuitive of why this may happen. But with perception of social costs, this shows that even if majority men, majority women are provided with the sexual harassment awareness training, it is not able to change perception of social costs in these classes as compared to a male intervention where uh, you know, majority men were provided with the training. Now, importantly, I find that the female intervention does not have any effect on any type of sexual harassment uh, as reported by women again. Uh, and the coefficients are very small as compared to the male treatment. This gives, me, this gives me confidence in the male intervention in the sense that it shows that the results for extreme events for male intervention were being uh, most likely, well, I can say more confidently that they were being driven by men instead of the women. So this is the last set of uh, results, and I, I promise I'll conclude after this. So here I'm showing you the results for opposite gender relationships. Now, in the first panel, I'm showing you results for the female treatment. And in the second panel, I'm showing you the results for male treatment, again, to facilitate a comparison. All outcomes have been standardized. Now, in column one, same as before, I find that the female treatment reduces uh, uh, women's relationships with men in their own class. The results are a bit stronger, but you know, uh, of course, like they seem similar here. Now, however, more important than this, 
I find that the female treatment reduces women's relationships also with men outside their class. On the other hand, the male treatment increases women's relationship with men outside their class, which shows that the male treatment does not reduce the utility that maybe women get from being with men uh, or from cooperating with men in that sense, because um, uh, they reduce the relationship with only men in their class who were treated, but not with men outside their class. In fact, they substitute away from them. Um, and the female treatment, however, leads to a reduction in women's relationships with all type of men. And that, you know, again, this is consistent with the, uh, with the framework that this is driven by a change in women's perception of their environment, reducing women's utility for, uh, for interacting or being in a relationship with men. Um, importantly, if I combine these results with sexual harassment results in the last uh, slide, it shows that perhaps gender segregation will not lead, you know, may not lead to a reduction in sexual harassment, because even though women's relationships here because of the female treatment reduced, they do not lead to a reduction in uh, reported sexual harassment by women. I, uh, uh, same as before, I do not find any effects on opposite gender fr friendships outside class. So to conclude, um, the main training uh, for sexual harassment reduces extreme sexual harassment reported by women uh, significantly and robustly by 0.125 to standard deviations. A null effect on milder forms of sexual harassment, however, cannot be rejected. There is a significant reduction, I find, in opposite gender relationships, but it is driven by women's choices. And this is theoretically and empirically consistent with an increase in perceived social disapproval against harassment more than a change in intrinsic attitudes. The caveat here is that these results are in the three months after the intervention. And so effects on intrinsic attitudes can emerge in the long run and a long run survey will be important for that. Perceived social costs can reduce sexual harassment as I hopefully have convinced you, but also they reduce relationships between men and women. And so welfare effects are, um, you know, uh, are, are, that is still remains an open question. The comparison with the female intervention shows that engaging men may be key to reduce harassment and improve women's outcomes. And this is in line with recent uh, you know, works by, by, again, by Bhar et al. and Ashraf et al. that shows that engaging men might be important to improve women's outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Karmini. And uh, I think uh, we can first move on to Nishit, your uh, uh, comments on this, and then, uh, then we'll open it for questions. So can you see the slides or? Yeah, yeah, we can see. So excellent uh, paper, Carmini. Uh, I would not say excellent, beautiful paper. Um, and uh, gives lots of hope that uh, things can change. So I really enjoyed uh, reading this paper. And thanks to Farzana for giving me an opportunity to read this paper, which uh, 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 it's just awesome uh, in terms of uh, timing. So I am going to be cognizant of a few things, like what are the things uh, you can do to improve the paper because uh, the experiment is done. You can't go back in many ways. So I'm going to keep that in mind and not give you the set of comments, which just you cannot do. Uh, so so uh, she has already explained the objective of the paper, kind of it, it, it tries to get at uh, uh, impact or efficacy of a sexual harassment uh, awareness program or intervention in India in a very relevant setting, which is college. Uh, very encouraging findings. Um, and uh, it, the paper is quite novel in terms of the contribution because if you look into the efficacy of sexual training programs, I mean, I'm not aware of uh, studies which has done that. Like something that always comes to my mind is in the US, we go through sexual harassment training every year and I haven't seen any paper uh, done, done, done on that. So this paper is really novel in that sense. Uh, as I said, the results gives us a ray of hope and I just love this paper. So, okay. Uh, now, something that I felt while reading the introduction, which uh, I'm sure will, uh, 
continue to change before you submit to a journal or uh, for your job market. Now, should you frame this as efficacy of sexual harassment training program? Or should you frame this more towards changing attitude of men uh, towards sexual harassment? Like, I think this is the trade-off or this is where you might want to think more because on one hand, I feel that uh, when you start talking about or when you start pushing this idea about attitude of men towards sexual harassment, I think that has a much more value in terms of the contribution. I mean, I'm not saying the efficacy is not, I mean, they both are, but you have to keep a balance uh, and your paper kind of gets at both. So that's why I think it's something that you might want to think about which one to push and which one to push more. Uh, the lab experiment is really clever and it gets as close at, as it can to, to say hard outcomes. And I think you should play this up more in the introduction because it's a consequential outcome for you. So uh, this is something uh, you can work on the introduction. Uh, the training, we already know, uh, it's three to five hours of training spread over 3.5 months. It's relatively, you know, the, the, the size of the impact is pretty high uh, compared to the three to five hours training. Um, and has, uh, I'm glad that uh, she, she brought up uh, social psychology literature because that's just so important in this context. And uh, the, it was very clever to have this kind of empathy uh, built in. Um, so I, great job with that actually, yeah. So now a little bit about the first stage, which I think like in when you try to do any training program, I think it's very important to understand not just this training program, any training program around sexual harassment, teachers training, like you pick up training programs. I think what we need to understand is like, what did the training do? And any program like this, it depends on how well the training was implemented. And you might want to think about this as a first stage. Uh, although the ideal solution is to test this empirically, but uh, the experiment is over. Is there a way you can add a little bit more? Maybe you already have the information. Uh, I, I might have missed bits and pieces in the appendix, <coughs> but was there some variation in the quality of trainers? Uh, did the understanding of uh, uh, sexual harassment or what constitutes sexual harassment changed by male and female classmates. I think you have some evidence on that. Uh, did the training move any of the priors? Uh, similarly, did the training change conscious or unconscious beliefs about what constitutes sexual harassment? Like, do you have any qualitative evidence that you can add? I think that will be quite useful. Uh, the privacy, uh, I saw some pictures in the paper, which is always very helpful. Uh, I did feel that maybe you could have uh, like little bit, uh, I would have preferred more privacy, uh, but again, uh, it's just a comment, maybe it's not an issue for uh, others. Uh, results. Um, we already know that uh, the key, like to me, the biggest highlight was uh, uh, having an impact on extreme events, uh, which Karmini described. Um, and it's really amazing, but yet puzzling because it has no impact on mild and intermediate forms of sexual harassment. So uh, maybe you can, uh, in the paper, when you rewrite the paper, think about how to explain that. Uh, and in the lab experiment, uh, again, like I don't know if it's possible, but there seems to be a room to explore a bit more because lab experiment allows you to run some, some experiments very tightly. Uh, so something that came to my mind uh, is uh, uh, think about soft forms of sexual harassment, like, you know, uh, and someone might care about this, and say in a lab setting, is it possible to explore, say some of the deeper question, like, you know, why men uh, do soft form of sexual harassment? Is it, uh, I think that's really not understood, at least uh, I haven't seen anything in economics, we were trying to do this in uh, Hyderabad. We were trying to survey uh, uh, offenders, uh, men uh, who are on the street, but also who are in uh, uh, jail uh, for say extreme forms of sexual harassment. We haven't been able to do that. Uh, but I think if you try to go back or if you have some money left, you can uh, survey some of the men just to understand like, you know, uh, what do they derive from that? Uh, hard outcome, uh, 
I feel that this training program is uh, useful, not just for the setting in the college, but even at home. So is it possible that you can go back and call your students and ask if they have reported any forms of sexual harassment to the nearest police station or get this information from the police station, which might be harder. So just like calling your sample and asking them uh, if they reported any sexual harassment by uh, even the family members. And this could apply to both male and female uh, harassers. Uh, sorry, male and female um, uh, college student in your sample. I think that's worth exploring given that the phone survey will not be very expensive. Uh, mechanisms, I think what you have done is really good. Uh, and, uh, but I had like some comments about mechanism and you know, I'm happy to talk uh, later uh, uh, about this. So as far as the awareness goes, I think that's very important because I think that uh, some of these interventions really move the needle around awareness. Uh, to me, it wasn't obvious what set of questions you have used to test this, or I, I could have just missed this. But my own understanding is this measure is very tricky. Uh, and a credible way to measure this is by like creating some videos of different forms of sexual harassment, uh, means like uh, uh, mild, intermediate, and extreme ones. And as I said, I'm happy to share the videos because we have created videos for this to test if the underlying awareness moved before and after the training. And maybe it's possible to go back to your control group and test some of these things. Uh, results from tab table seven is very, very helpful. And I think uh, this result has actually extreme policy implications. So that's another results that you might want to kind of play up more in, even into introduction. Uh, results from table eight suggest that some of the preference measure did not move. Uh, I think intellectually it is important to understand this since again, this, these, are, these are the set of uh, outcomes that's not well understood in the literature. Uh, now, something that again, like, you know, you can completely ignore this, something that if you have some resources, try to see if you can add or kind of work on some of these uh, suggestions if it's useful. So I think your underlying mechanisms are very site based intervention, like, you know, persuasion, empathy, and I can like go on. Um, and there are like several uh, mechanisms and that's the advantage or disadvantage of getting into the psych literature. And uh, unfortunately, I have been spending too much time on psych papers. But is it possible for in some sense, like think about going back to your sample or going back to your control group. If you cannot do any of these things, think about using Prolific, which is very good in UK. Uh, I wouldn't recommend MTurk, but uh, is there a way to try some of these things online or say call it sample uh, in the UK? The reason I mention is uh, as you motivated in the introduction or as most of us know here is these harassments, it's just common everywhere. Like if you pick up any college campus anywhere in the world, I think these numbers would not look that different. So I think it's possible to add, let's say, you know, run something at Warwick or on Prolific. And I think having evidence from different countries will be like, uh, that really will increase the value of the paper even more. Uh, and I was just thinking about like, if you add a bunch of these experiments, uh, maybe you can try like a, a journal like Science or even PNS. And of course, Econ is, uh, uh, you might want to try Econ first, but my idea was like, add a bit more because the uh, context matters, uh, but the nature of your question, I think it's, you can explore this in other countries as well. So I would love, I would have loved to see a bit more on the underlying mechanism because that's uh, very intriguing. Uh, and uh, does these training change deeper behavior towards sexual harassment is again underexplored and you have made an excellent attempt in this paper to get at this. Uh, spillovers, uh, I, I found the spillover results very intriguing. Uh, is it the case that they didn't share with friends due to stigma of having participated in sexual harassment? You know, and uh, I not, I mean, you did list experiment in the Google form, but uh, did you think about having a very short survey of social desirability bias question? Maybe you did it. Uh, if you have not, I mean, you can ignore this. Uh, other comments, I think introduction is quite long and uh, you can move some of these things to different sections. 
uh, something on numbering of the sections, uh, maybe in a footnote, add power calculations. Uh, and, um, and did you uh, reach out to the 5% of the people who quit the survey to understand why they left? A uh, little bit, a uh, few more questions. Did you do a debriefing at the end? Did the control group receive any training after the intervention? And that's it. Okay, uh, Nishit, thanks so much. That was, uh, I, I think it's a great paper, Karmini. Uh, you know, like Nishit said, a novel first attempt at uh, measuring this very important question. And Nishit, I think you've given great uh, comments as well to improve. I also have a couple of comments, but I would, uh, you know, so for those of you who joined us late, we are re running about 15 minutes uh, uh, behind schedule uh, because of some technical glitch in the beginning from Carmini's uh, side. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, what I'm going to do is to let uh, Carmini, you can take a, a five minutes maybe to just respond to any comments if you would like to do that now. And then, uh, you know, I can ask my question and we'll also open it up for uh, some other questions. Uh, yeah. Firstly, I wanted to really, really thank Nishit for like really, really constructive feedback. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear it uh, because I've read your papers before I even started my PhD. Uh, so um, the uh, regarding um, the, I think one of the main points that stood out to me is that uh, you said about uh, uh, looking at awareness and how I measured that, uh, I can be more, uh, I can, uh, you know, say it more in the paper, but uh, I measured awareness through hypothetical case scenarios. Um, and uh, I asked students whether they, whether, whether it is sexual harassment or not. Uh, and so that th I don't ask them, do you think it is sexual harassment? I ask them, is it like, is it legally sexual harassment or not, according to you? And, and so that kind of gets at this idea of, you know, whether you think it's right or not. So at it, at uh, awareness rather than attitudes and that is also one of the reasons because um that i don't have social desirability questions because i did not you know i did not uh, ask them directly about their attitudes in lieu of that i asked these intrinsic attitudes precisely because i felt that and i also you know from reading from the literature as well that uh, demand effect or social desirability or demand effects for sexual harassment related questions with the men you know that is the that was very tricky and so i had to you know come up with these measures for intrinsic attitudes uh, and you know hopefully you know i i i can convince uh, the audience that you know um, you know they are getting at what we wanted to get at which do not move uh, move as you correctly pointed out um regarding the um, uh, the uh, mechanisms uh, so uh, here um so i asked beliefs about peers so that i uh, i think you know again like in my results i was not very very detailed about it but it was an index where i asked students about their beliefs about their peers so do you think your your classmates uh, are going to you know sanction someone if they sexually harass or uh, do you think your uh, classmates are going to go and report sorry the women in your class are going to report to your friends so these uh, you know I, these are like these perception uh, uh, you know or belief measures that i have i do not have anything explicit on empathy uh, but you're right like i definitely take that you know uh, uh, feedback that I can go back, perhaps try to go back to the control and, and get at those measures. Um, regarding uh, the spillovers, so the end line was done. I My understanding is that because the end line was done three months after the treatment, and that's why, you know, there is no, there wasn't much time for spillovers, uh, but, you know, they might kind of become apparent in, a, in the longer run, for sure. Um, uh, regarding uh, Mm, uh, trainers. So the trainers were specific to the college. Uh, and so I have college fixed effects. So I think it controls for quality of trainers, but I, I don't have that variation that you're talking about, unfortunately. Uh, I think I can maybe take more questions. These are the ones that I remember. So I, I think you should take questions from the audience. You know, uh, <laughs> we can set up a time to talk as, as uh, you know, I, I really like the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'll take advantage of being the, um, you know, the moderator, the chair and ask the first question. Uh, so we have uh, six more minutes and um, the question, uh, you know, that I had was that, is there, you know, any way that 
you know, the, since you don't see results on and nothing significant for mild forms of, uh, but you see in extreme forms. So I was wondering if it could be that there is some kind of a substitution that now, you know, students know that this information is sort of common knowledge. And so I would substitute towards uh, more violence outside, right? Uh, outside the college than inside. I mean, I was just thinking because it comes uh, very close to that literature on, you know, banning alcohol. Um, and uh, then, you know, we, we observe that there is the shift in violence from the streets to uh, homes, right? So in the similar uh, spirit, perhaps, is there any way that you could, you know, think through that, that maybe, uh, you know, the boys have just uh, moved they substituted to outside uh, college. And the only reason I'm asking this is because, uh, you know, the, 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 you, you're not observing anything for, uh, you know, the marginal or the uh, small kinds of violence. And that's where I would have expected that a three month intervention would have made more of a difference. Thank you so much for that question. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's super interesting. Uh, I think, Unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to get at this substitution because I because I rely on women's reports to measure sexual harassment. So, you know, and that is what is tightly linked to the treatment. It's very difficult for, I mean, I don't know how much we will trust that, you know, if we ask these men, did you harass someone, those reports are, you know, those results are, are trustworthy. So I, you know, I did not go there at all, but uh, it's a super interesting question. Unfortunately, I don't think, you know, I have an innovative way to answer it. Sure, sure. I'll actually, uh, so we have another four minutes if anyone else has a question. Yes, Sheetal, please go ahead. So, Karvini, I don't have questions. I just have a few comments. Um, and some of them just echo what Nishit just said already. I think it's a wonderful paper, or at least the, the way you've tried to do this, it's very ambitious and, and very interesting as well. But just in the spirit of providing a little bit of sort of feedback and direction in terms of you know getting this published, one of the key things that is going to come up, um, and Nishit, you know, mentioned this, but but this will come up when you try and submit this paper, uh, is the social desirability, and you know, so so if you ask a man, if you if you've provided them with some training and then ask them, hey, by the way, have you become more aware or such, they're going to say yes, possibly, right? So even if you haven't done anything in terms of collecting the data or such. This is something you should front and center attempt to address in your paper, you know, address the caveats of your paper. And so address how this might factor play a role and what you can do to mitigate it. Top of my head, I can't think of anything, but, but you know, that is one point. And second is, you know, uh, talk about external validity. This is three colleges in Delhi. so. You know what is this context and how this will sort of how do we take this and make it more generalizable maybe you've done that in the paper but but you know I, I haven't read the paper but as a you know I can I can tell you what the referees might be thinking when they read it and third is as uh, Nishit pointed out the policy ramifications so if a policy maker is interested in this what what is it that that they are going to learn so do a little bit on that um, and talk about cost benefit analysis, if any, you know, you, there are uh, in, in epidemiology and public health, for example, there is work that says, okay, you know, what is the psychological cost of, of, you know, being victims to violent crimes for women. And so then if you are, you know, if some kind of harassment and severe form of harassment has gone down, then, then you can sort of do at, at least a ballpark, you know, back of the envelope calculation, what it costs to do this training per person and was there any tangible benefit from policy perspective. So ultimately, I think the goal is to try and see, you know, what to do uh, such that this very, very ubiquitous issue faced by girls and women uh, is addressed. So, so I think that speaking to those things will, you know, increase the value added of your paper in the minds of referees. Thank you. 
So uh, Sheetal, uh, since you brought up and Karmini, uh, and maybe like this is a question that uh, we can uh, help a bit. Like, is it possible to uh, either get some sort of a police station report if somebody called? I think that will also be good because this is what, six to eight months after the intervention or one year, just to see if there is anything descriptive that you can add that you followed up with this sample and X number reported to the police station, something that happened at home, something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rashmi, can I, should, should I? Uh, uh, I think we'll just let Sonia ask the question yeah. so that yeah. we can go on to the next paper. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, hi. Um, so Karmini, it's the first time I've seen this work. I'm really impressed. I think the roundedness of it is, um, is unusual and very good because you have the lab experiment, you have the female intervention, the male intervention, and I think it's really important to have demonstrated that the uh, that it's important to intervene on men and that it works. Um, it could be that you spoke about this, but I missed it because I joined a little bit late. But I wondered if you looked at spillovers, um, in other words, that men who were not treated behaving better, um, and somewhat related but distinct in your model, which referred to the Leonardo Burstyn model. Uh, paper. Um, there was, I think, maybe it went too quickly for me, but I think there was a parameter that indicated costs from uh, costs associated with deviating from a social norm. So I just wondered if you circled back and could identify uh, the role of social norms in the mechanisms. And the last comment is just, uh, I probably missed it, but what are the baseline rates of extreme events? Uh, can we need to yeah. quickly respond yeah. in just under one minute? Yes. Uh, so I will go to uh, uh, Sheetal's um, comments. Uh, firstly, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, they were, I think their comments and they are great comments. I think that's super constructive feedback. Thank you so much. I cannot, uh, yeah, there's nothing I can, you know, say to that, but just thank you for it. For Nishit, uh, regarding uh, police station reports, so uh, I would have to think about it, but the a close, uh, a close um, uh, substitute to that is the internal complaints committees in these colleges. I tried to get at that data, but the uh, these committees told me that uh, you know that, and and also that that I could see from the data from the students that students don't really want to go to these committees to report, and you know and that's supported because I find that within the data. Uh, students are more likely to want to, you know, talk to their classmates and their acquaintances about sexual harassment than going to the internal uh, complaints committee. And I find it from women. So it seems that, you know, that uh, they, you know, yeah, so the training is somehow creating this, I don't know, this environment where women are feeling maybe more supportive, but only from the from their peers rather than going to the uh, committees. So I don't, yeah, I don't have I don't think uh, I can go to the complaint committee and get any anything from them. Okay, thanks, thanks. 